And it's inspiring, actually, to look around this room and see all these people who really share a common goal of getting safe and effective treatments to patients who need them urgently. This morning, uh, we spent a few minutes talking about the obstacles and the challenges to drug development and rare disease. Everything from lack of knowledge is about disease and disease progression, disease variability. And then we talked a bit about the importance of keeping patients at the center of drug development and the critical role that they play as disease experts, and also in this collaboration, um, also as data contributors. And then the closing panel, we heard also a little bit about the promise and the potential of pre-competitive collaboration, which is really exciting. So this afternoon, we'll transition a little bit and we'll dive into some case examples um, of existing data models and how they can support the RDCA DAP initiative. So for our first speaker this afternoon, I'd like to introduce Samantha Bud Haberlin. She is the Vice President and Late Stage Clinical Development Unit Head at Biogen, and she'll be talking to us about the role of data sharing in accelerating drug development for rare disease. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Um, so this morning we were talking a lot about challenges and I would like to say I hope that we will shift to talking about solutions this afternoon. Um, however, we need to dwell a little bit on challenges to understand um, the solutions. Um, as Alexa mentioned, I work at Biogen and in my role I lead clinical development for uh, late stage um, programs in both highly prevalent disorders such as the dementias um, but also some of those dementias being quite rare uh, in nature. So having that span of experience is something that I'd like to bring um, in the way of comparing and contrasting to some degree. I also have a role working with CPATH um, as an advocate for their data sharing initiative uh, across the neurosciences. And so I have some familiarity with uh, the work that has been done to date at CPATH. I have uh, contributed as a data contributor um, and have been a member of their consortia for more than a decade, I believe, at this point. And so I'm going to use an example of, some, of a success story uh, in my therapeutic area, which I think underpins the value of the RDCA DAP that we're talking about today. Um, one thing I, I wanted to say before I start is we talked a lot about challenges this morning. From my perspective as a drug developer, these are really exciting times for bringing forward potential new therapies for rare diseases. When I was in, in college, the science of the, the genetic basis of disease had started to be available to us to understand uh, the underpinnings, the pathophysiology of those diseases. But it's only now, more than 25 years later, that actually the advances in science enable us to bring forward the type of modalities, gene therapies, RNAi, antisense oligonucleotides, that enable us to directly address those disorders uh, through those mechanisms. So I, I believe it's quite exciting that we can now do something about those diseases. And so clinical development needs to catch up, needs to catch up quickly to be able to successfully implement those programs. Um, I am an employee of Biogen, but in this capacity today, I'm bringing you my personal experience, and this is not a corporate position. Okay. So let's just step back, step back a little bit. We are here to celebrate a launch for rare diseases. However, the work needed to develop effective treatments for any disease is a massive undertaking and requires many difficult parameters to be solved. And we've been hearing solved in advance rather than solved in parallel. And there is a pressing need for us to have clinical trials that are based on uh, better informed clinical trials. And for rare diseases in particular, the need to quantify and characterize these diseases is particularly acute given the small numbers of individuals. And I'll exemplify really, how does that play out in clinical development? Why is that so troubling? 
We just had a really wonderful panel where I'm sure that we heard each and every one of these points made um, by very experienced individuals working in this space. Um, much of the challenges in rare drug disease are based on the, or underpinned by the small and heterogeneous populations that those diseases are characterized by. What we often have is a lack of disease understanding, and that's a really big term, and that one is foundational, lack of understanding the mechanisms of disease, the progression of disease, the variability of disease. In many of these disorders, but not all, there's often a high heterogeneity, uh, which presents itself in variability in both presentation and course of disease. The lack of scientific understanding, if present, is really uh, difficult from a designing new drugs um, perspective. But challenges in cl clinical trial designs are real when you have very few patients, very few subjects that you can examine. And we've heard, oft we've heard a number of times the idea of the control arm, or it's been referred to the placebo control. Um, and indeed, the value uh, and the role of natural hist history studies in that, in that perspective. Limited patient numbers, and geographic dispersal. Um, we, we heard of that in the context of diagnosis this morning, but indeed simply measuring something in a multiple, multiple geographic regions is quite difficult, which also comes to many of the outcome assessments are absent or under-informed. And biomarkers, as wonderful as they may be, may also be completely absent or ill-understood. And last but not least, and certainly not unimportant, is the evolving standard of care. And, and from this is both um, support to patients as well as emerging treatments to patients, which is obviously what we are all working towards. So if I put my hat on then and ask the question of what can we learn uh, from larger development programs um, in rare disease development, while we're discussing the rare diseases, these challenges are not unique. So, for example, when we're doing clinical trials in more common, um, more prevalent diseases, our earlier clinical trials, which are often smaller, have um, fewer patients involved in them, we want them to be more efficient, so we don't want them to take particularly long. We do want them to be able to make critical go, no go uh, decisions. They are also often based on limited data, smaller numbers of patients, quite significant information gaps on a backdrop of an evolving disease understanding. And we really need not only that trial to inform us whether that drug may have potential, but also to inform the next stage of development, the pivotal trial or phase three design. So much of what we would like to be able to do in early clinical development is, is very similar to what is occurring in rare diseases. And all of this is in the setting of limited information. And for a company like myself, or indeed smaller or even larger companies, the information that you have to hand for these critical design features are often limited to what you have available internally. And if you are not a, a large pharmaceutical company who has been in a therapeutic area for many, many years, you don't have an internal database of these patient populations across the span of disease, across different subgroups, and on and on and on. So you have limited information. And this is important even in early clinical development because you have the same challenge, which is you do not want to stop a potentially effective therapeutic early. You want to make, be able to make informed decisions. I, my therapeutic area has almost exclusively been CNS disorders through my career, and, and these were mentioned by somebody on the panel this morning as exemplifying quite a number of the challenges that rare diseases face. For example, if you look at the box on the left here, uh, it was talked of in terms of target engagement. In the CNS, accessing the brain to be able to determine whether your drug has uh, uh, sufficient quantities in the brain is doing something that is related to what you expect it to do. Your, your biomarker access is very limited in CNS. It's improving with a great deal of investment. 
We also have in these extremely large populations, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's disease, a great deal of heterogeneity, which leads to massive variability in the data sets. Our endpoints are, and it st stands here as noisy, our endpoints are subject to a, a lot of um, difficulty in, in their precision, and they, they also introduce a great number of variability in the clinical trials, which is overcome generally by having very large numbers of subjects in these clinical trials, something that in rare diseases we don't have. The CNS diseases also present as slow, and their onset insidious. So their diagnosis and its precision is also a challenge. All of this really conspires to lead to an increase in variability in the data set. And we heard this morning from Dr. Woodcock that variability kills clinical trials. And why that is, is because variability can obscure your ability to see the potential treatment effect within that clinical trial. So even in these large disorders, reducing variability, understanding what your expectations are, is, is a very large piece of what we do in clinical development. And so how have we overcome that in these larger populations, and, and why is that of relevance to this? Um, we learned that data sharing provides the key to accelerating our capabilities, our disease understanding in any one of these diseases, and to enable us to more efficiently conduct drug development. Data sharing, integration, and quantification can all lead to better decision-making. Um, this very nice chart here with the kind of parameters from which one learns with aggregated data is something that class will take us through in uh, a presentation after mine. And we have successfully done this in one of the diseases that I work in, in Alzheimer's disease. And this was done together with CPATH, um, where uh, at the end we have what we call a clinical trial simulator. And I'll talk to you about that. Alzheimer's disease has got to seem to you as to be the antithesis of a rare disease. But if you'll allow me, I'll explain why this, has been, this may be helpful to understand what we're trying to do with the RDCA DAP. Um, Alzheimer's is a major disease. More than 5 million Americans are afflicted, diagnosed today with the disease, a very, very large population. But it, it nonetheless suffers from challenges including heterogeneity, we've heard that before, uh, poor disease understanding, shifting disease characterization, including disease progression, endpoints, and diagnosis. All the same problems that we're hearing about in these rare diseases. And several years back, CPATH convened a consortia of companies to share the data that they had from their recently completed or soon to be completed clinical trials. And more than 10 companies came together and contributed more than 14,000 individual data points from over 38 clinical trials. And this data collection is the basis of the clinical trial simulator that I'll show you. Um, but moreover, not only was that consortia able to tap into that information, but to date, nearly 500 qualified researchers from academia, industry and government have been accessing and using this data to enable their own ability to do research and conduct clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease. That is a quite phenomenal sharing of data. Here is the kind of output, one of many, many pieces of output um, from that clinical trial simulator. This um, graph to the right was work that was done by the CPATH quantitative scientists uh, led by Klaas and his team. And, and here we're looking at a disease progression model in mild and moderate Alzheimer's disease. And this, was, this took about 6,000 of the patients in that 14,000 patient database that I referred to. On the right-hand side, what we have is the model of a very specific, a 75-year-old male with Alzheimer's disease, and what's the disease progression at different stages of disease, uh, characterized by earlier on the left, middle, and then more advanced on the right. 
And not only do we see the difference in progression in those different stages, we see the difference in variability. And in the color code here, we see the influence of a major risk factor on both variability and progression. This type of information cannot be underestimated in how critical it is for someone like me when I'm designing a clinical trial. Okay. Incredibly important and very powerful. Uh, the Alzheimer's disease trial simulator went on to be submitted and received both the FDA fit for purpose designation and the EMA qualification opinion letter. So this high quality regulatory standard science is possible to come out of this type of effort as well. This is something that no one company could have achieved alone. That's very important to remember. So CPATH, who convened um, that particular effort, um, has over 15 such pre-competitive consortia today working in this way. And they also have other operating models, uh, including what we're discussing today with the RDCA DAP. Uh, CPATH was formed in response to the FDA's Critical Path Initiative and is specifically built for organizations to share clinical trial data in order to accelerate drug development. That is their mission and their purpose. And class will talk more about that. And over time, CPATH has built the extant expertise and infrastructure to be able to obtain, integrate, and make accessible high quality patient level data sets available and suitable for queries. Just as I outlined, not only are their internal analytics group able to work on and generate solutions, but that data is made available through portals to qualified researchers. And it is this core infrastructure that is now going to be used for the RDCA DAP. And so what is the RDCA DAP? We've seen this, this really nice diagram a number of times, and I'll take, it, take you through it a little bit to see how it resonates with you. What exactly is this? Because we've heard this is a database. Well, what is de depicted here is that it is a centralized infrastructure housed at CPATH. It will, as shown on the left, I don't have a pointer here, but these blue boxes that you see on the left, it will integrate all forms of data, academic research, real world evidence, industrial clinical trials, the deeper and the more, more high quality, the better it will be to inform drug development. This leverages, as I mentioned, the infrastructure of CPATH uh, data collection center to bring in to curate, to aggregate, to standardize, and to make available that high quality data. The database for RDCA DAP will be disease agnostic. It will be like one large house for the data to be able to come into. And however, within that, there will be a framework, a predetermined framework available for each and every possible uh, rare disease that needs it, such that any new disease entering data can stand up a database very rapidly within that infrastructure. And each framework does need to be customized. Each framework needs to be enriched by disease-specific parameters. And these will leverage the experience and connection with the scientific and patient community that Nord brings to the collaboration. Ultimately, the collaboration will have a user-friendly portal so I'm told these things often look far more complicated to me than I think are user. Um, and these, once again, will enable access to any individual group who contributes data, but also to qualified researchers. And so you will be able to toggle between disease-specific databases and then a pool of rare uh, disease data. Okay. By creating this, integrated database, what we're doing is, is more efficiently enabling these smaller diseases to be able to minimize the startup time or the development time to be able to put together that type of data. So there's no need for a one-off disease characterization effort, no need for a, a, a unique database built for each and every disease. This should minimize the delivery time for the new therapeutics um, to patients. 
I do believe that the combination of CPATH infrastructure and with the skills connection and scientific community connections of Nord, um, that the vision and expertise are in place to make this a great success. And I'm very much looking forward to the milestones that we will be looking forward to deliver in this collaboration. And even in the launch meeting here, there have already been um, commitments to share data. I've listed some, but I understand that there are even more that are already committed to be entered into this database. We have the Friedrichs Ataxia database, which was the first data source to commit to being part of, of the RDCA DAP. Nord's I Am Rare registry will be connected and it says here provocatively, who wants to be next? I hope that for those of you who are listening, that you're understanding just how important your data can be for many stakeholders. And so in summary, from my position as an industry drug developer who wants to bring forward new treatments for patients, there's never been a more pressing time to organize efficiently and bring together comprehensive data sharing as an approach to characterize the rare diseases such that we can do more informed and more efficient clinical trials in these rare diseases. The RDCA DAP is going to enable that sharing, which is critically important across the rare diseases, much more so than our more prevalent diseases, and will enable those clinical trials to be um, more informed and will maximize the utility of data from each and every one of your patients. And by working together, I do believe that CPATH and Nord will have the possibility to transform drug development in this space. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Samantha. I'd next like to introduce Vanessa Boulanger, who is Nord's Director of Research. She's going to be providing an overview of Nord's I Am Rare Registry platform. Please join me in welcoming her to the stage. Okay, so thank you to the audience, um, both those who are here with us in person and those that are with us via live stream for participating in this incredibly exciting day and for joining the conversation about how we can meaningfully partner together to move this groundbreaking initiative forward, to shift and reorient the landscape of scientific discovery and drug development for rare diseases, and to speed the development of cures to save lives. As the Director of Research at the National Organization for Rare Disorders, NORD, I have the distinct opportunity to share some of NORD's research and registry work with you today to talk a bit about how Nord centers the rare disease community as research partners, and to share with you an overview of our collab collaborative registry models. Just a minute. <laughs> OK, great. Uh, so here's an overview of what I'll cover in this session. We'll start with a brief introduction to Nord, and then I will give an overview of the history, development, and growth of Nord's registry program, describe Nord's partnership and collaborative research models, share a few real world case studies from our registry community, and then situate the value and impact of the RDCA DAP in context. So 2019 marks Nord's 36th year as an organization founded by patients and patient organization leaders dedicated to elevating the voice of the rare disease community, driving progress and innovation. Nord is a truly independent 501c3 community advocacy organization representing all patients and families affected by rare diseases. We have no industry on our board of directors or in any of our governance committees and we are fully funded by charitable donations, grants, and through providing services to individuals, communities, and companies working in the rare disease space. 
So this image gives a sense of where and how Nord's programmatic areas intersect and complement one another to provide support to patients and families throughout all phases of their journey, and how Nord's research work fits into the larger context of the organization while we strategically move toward processes that support data-driven decision-making at every level. In our policy portfolio at the federal level, we led the development and passage of the Orphan Drug Act in 1983, and we continue to uphold and preserve the legislation. We have established a guide for drug and value pricing principles toward ensuring fair access to affordable treatments. And at the state level, our Rare Action Network is a grassroots initiative that mobilizes coalition building at the community and state level, and we have over 14,000 members across 50 states. Our Patient Services Program launched in 1987 and continues to serve over 7,000 people annually, reflecting Nord's commitment to reducing barriers and personal costs related to accessing available diagnostics, clinical trials, and rare disease treatments. Our education team hosts Nord's annual summit in October and our patient and family conference in June, works with experts to produce our rare disease reports, which drive over 1.5 million website visits each month, and the team regularly hosts webinars and training opportunities for the community. Our membership department builds capacity, supporting over 280 member organizations, and the growth and development of newly forming organizations through a peer mentorship program. And our research and innovation portfolio has three aims. Research that we conduct, so original social behavioral and socioeconomic studies. Research that we support through our registry program, which I will get into in more detail. And research that we help to fund through our research grants program, which is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. So how does the Rare community experience the work that we do? Nord is a partner on their Rare journey. Nord takes a 360 degree view of the Rare community as part of our mission to improve the lives of those living with rare diseases, ensuring meaningful community partnership at every step. So the history, development, and growth of the I Am Rare registry program So the timeline shows uh, key milestones in the development of our registry program. We were and we remain deeply attuned to the need for foundational understanding of many rare conditions and acknowledge that the information is not available for many rare diseases. So in order to address that need for the rare disease community at large, we developed the I Am Rare registry program as an enduring resource for the systematic collection of natural history study data. The program itself was developed after a multi-year, multi-stakeholder planning process to address the critical need for foundational natural history study data for rare diseases with the goal of working in partnership with patient communities to support the documentation of people's lived experiences, observe the course of disease over time, understand variations in treatment and outcomes, examine factors that influence prognosis and quality of life, document the delivery, quality, and transitions in care, and assess community preferences and value thresholds. Our platform is designed to capture patient-reported, patient-experience data, in addition to clinical and medical data, on the natural history of rare conditions to support and inform the design of patient-centered clinical trials, the identification of subpopulations and subtypes of conditions, to serve as a complementary data set to unify the patient community, and to establish baseline understanding of rare conditions to accelerate science and discovery. The natural history studies on our platform have no set end date in order to support sufficiently long data capture to demonstrate clinically meaningful outcomes, variability in the course of the disease, and data that includes outcomes that are important to patients over time. So 2019 marks the five-year anniversary of NORD's registry program we launched our first registry in 2014, and we have been fortunate to have early and continued engagement with a committee of stakeholders from NIH, the FDA, 
community organizations, patients, researchers, clinicians, who at a very early stage a number of years ago underscored the critical need for natural history studies and who have guided us as data ontology and data standards experts and have provided input on our programmatic and platform design. Our model keeps data ownership in the hands of community organizations and patients, reduces restrictive data silos, and through partnership, we build capacity to empower and support patient organizations and communities to become data stewards and registry experts. So for those who are less familiar with NORD's Natural History Study Platform and Rare Disease Research Program, NORD provides the registry platform. It's a common infrastructure for longitudinal multi-time point data collection. We provide a core set of surveys, so common data dictionary and a question repository, to support standardized and harmonized cross-disease, cross-community data collection and analysis. And in addition, our platform allows for customized layers of data collection through disease-specific surveys. Each registry has an advisory committee of key opinion leaders and disease experts that inform survey development and the schedule of data collection. We hear from our community directly with requests for new features and functionality, so we are able to iterate our, our development in ways that are meaningful to the community. Our platform is a tool to capture survey-based patient data, in addition to curated clinical data, in disease-specific registries across distinct rare disease communities. And NORD provides the programmatic support around the registry. So we have individualized one-on-one -on -one relationships with our registry partners. We provide training on our platform and reference guides. We provide study resources, such as the core survey library that I mentioned. And we provide survey development and design support. We also provide templates for study protocol development, consent, and marketing. We have a central IRB partnership. We provide webinars for ongoing training, regular updates through newsletters, and we build community by encouraging communication across our registry leaders in peer-to-peer -peer mentoring relationships. So our highest priority is to collect data to advance discovery and save lives. But our first priority by design and necessity is to collect high quality, high utility data in a way that is not burdensome to the study participant. We designed our platform to be intuitive, user-friendly, and engaging, with longitudinal messaging and reminders to welcome people into our community and encourage participation over time. All registry studies on our platform have an IRB-approved protocol. All participants consent prior to sharing data. And the registries are established as a long-term resource for the community without a defined study end date. I'm not having luck with that. OK. Um, so we support easy study management with the ability to create a customized and personalized dashboard and participant profile, and the ability to participate in multiple research studies from a central location. And for our registry community leaders, we developed a community portal, as I mentioned earlier, where NORD can share updates and guidance documents and the registry leaders can post resources and materials to share with other registry managers in NORD's community. It is a way for the community to remain connected, to transfer expertise, and to encourage peer-to-peer -peer learning and mentorship. So since the launch of our program in 2014, we have seen ex exponential growth, and we now support over 40 registry partnerships we have over 10,000 participants across our registries, and we have over 80,000 survey submissions to date. So we started with an, a NORD community organization partnership model, where NORD works very closely in a one-to-one -one relationship with the community organization to guide the design, structure, and implementation of a registry. The community organization is advised by a scientific and medical advisory committee. 
the organization manages the day-to-day -day aspects of the registry, and the community organization owns the data. NORD continues to be a resource and a partner and to provide guidance as the registry matures, as the purpose and goals of the registry expand, and as opportunities for collaboration and requests for data sharing increase. We help organizations who would like the support to navigate complex research and partnership decisions. We have expanded our service models to include registries for communities that do not have a formalized 501c3, where NORD is the registry sponsor or program manager, and the idea is to transition ownership if or when a community organization is developed. So this model was established as an initial step toward reducing barriers to registry development and participation, and as a way for NORD to help elevate the communities that don't yet have an organization to advocate on their behalf. And we also support partnerships with industry and academic stakeholders, where we can partner to establish a disease-specific registry, very similar to the one-to-one -one model that we have started out with for our community organizations, or we can facilitate a partnership with industry or academic partners and the community organization that has an existing registry on our platform through a sub-study or a nested embedded study. So the idea is to provide a clear pathway for research and industry partnerships. So in effect, we create a triangulation between third-party researchers from industry or academia, NORD, and the patient community. So essentially, where there is a main registry, a primary disease-specific registry on our platform, the sub-study feature allows for a nested or embedded study with distinct eligibility or inclusion criteria, study-specific consent, and data exclusivity for a defined period of time. It allows participants to engage in multiple studies, all through a centralized registry, and allows researchers to establish time-bound or funding-bound studies while preserving the cohesiveness of the patient community. This model reduces the need for redundant duplicative registry efforts, breaks down data silos and preserves the power of the data, and also reduces research burden and oversaturation in the community. The sub-study or embedded study feature is a solution to some known challenges in rare disease research and is a useful tool for looking at variations and adverse events. We have found that the availability of a sub-study increases enrollment in the main primary study while also providing a recruitment mechanism for the embedded sub-study. A key point about this model is that it can keep data proprietary and separate by stakeholder, but it supports keeping the community together and unified in a central registry. So a few real-world case studies from NORD's registry community. So currently we have a number of registries at various stages of development and maturity, we, ranging from in development and planning to newly launched to two to five years of data collected. So overall, we have seen rapid progress with the support, guidance, and training up front that NORD can provide. I'd like to highlight just a few community successes that demonstrate the real, real world application and impact of natural history registry data. A new mechanism was identified for SYNGAP1, and the discovery was informed by registry data from the Bridge the Gap Foundation. In the fall of 2018, the team published a manuscript in Nature Journal reflecting the link between patient reported and clinical registry data and lab-based research. In the registry, there were reports of children not feeling pain, so a child with a broken finger for multiple days who never complained, or a child who kept putting its hand in the dog's mouth and then not showing an expected pain response. And this information led to new pathways for exploration in mouse models. So the natural history registry data pointed lab researchers in a new direction, which ultimately led to a new discovery. An example of another type of collaboration is the Fibrous Dysplasia Foundation, who held a competitive application process for researcher projects to work with the FDF registry data. The team received around 10 proposals, and the institutions reflected included Boston Children's, UCSF, and Harvard Medical School, among others. So these opportunities to work with the registry data are reaching well-established institutions. 
Within six months of launching their registry, our GBS CIDP registry partners were approached to collaborate with an academic partner on a PCORI grant to fund a multi-year research project. And our registry community leaders are getting invited to a number of different meetings, conferences, and forums to present as experts on registry data. For example, the Platelet Disorder Support Association, who you will hear more from on the panel this afternoon, was specifically asked by FDA to present on their registry experience and data at a public workshop on key ways to effectively engage with patient communities. And PDSA was also selected to host an externally led PFDD meeting this past July. So all just to say that our registry partners are being sought out as resources and experts in this space and the natural history studies are driving multi-stakeholder collaborative partnerships. Another case study example, so one of the sub-studies on our platform was designed to look at serious medical events and how prader willi syndrome related behaviors change over time. The study will run for four years and the recruitment target was reached within the first six months. Participants were recruited from within the established registry and the marketing for the sub-study drove increased enrollment in the main primary study. The data will be used to inform the development and design of clinical trials and new treatments for prader willi syndrome. And the sub-study reflects a partnership between the Foundation for prader willi Research, an industry partner, and NORD. And Dr. Teresa Strong from the Foundation for prader willi Research will also be on the panel this afternoon and can share additional de details. And finally, this summer, Nord published a book, The Power of Patience, Informing Our Understanding of Rare Diseases, in collaboration with Trio Health as our analytics partner, that included a very generous forward from Dr. Woodcock. The book amplifies the experiences of individuals and families living with rare conditions and aims to shift the dialogue and demonstrate the power and possibility of natural history study data. We developed this book to be an accessible and informative resource for all, highlighting an initial six of our registry communities through patient stories, plain language medical descriptions of each of the conditions, and visualizations of the aggregated data from the natural history studies. So just to bring us full circle, um, back to the RDCA DAP project, Um, so this initiative has the potential to be a transformative collaboration. It will leverage the capabilities and expertise of the partners involved. It will include the development of new tools and data optimization to accelerate discovery and therapeutic product development. So the RDCA DAP will provide an opportunity to manufacture larger patient populations by combining data sets and data sources creating elevated opportunities for novel data use cases. The RDC ADAPT supports the flexibility to design solutions to overcome well-known data challenges. For example, developing cross-disease clinical outcome assessment measures that reflect outcomes that are meaningful to patients, that are likely to demonstrate change, and that are relevant for reporting in clinical trials. The partnership supports the effective use of resources and the accelerator provides a platform for the development of innovative technologies that drive efficiencies and reduce costs, including the potential to advance scientific timelines and discovery by grouping like conditions. And finally, the RDCA DAP will provide foundational infrastructure to build upon and accomplish the additional goals of the broader rare disease cures accelerator that we heard about from FDA colleagues this morning. So how does NORD support the vision, value, and impact of the RDCA and the DAP in particular? And how can different stakeholders get involved? <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, NORD's platform is a centralized, disease-neutral platform. NORD is well set up to define the characterization of rare diseases, both baseline characteristics and disease progression, through developing in partnership prospective, observational, and clinical natural history studies. We have mechanisms for the consolidation of stakeholder efforts, and we employ a community-driven approach to our program and our platform. In support of the RDCA DAP, we have the capability to evaluate 
clinical outcome assessments for fit for purpose use across rare diseases. We currently have, um, sorry, we currently support the systematic collection of data and have the capability to expand the standardization further to support data harmonization and interoperability. For example, our technology supports the collection of data for all rare conditions with a core set of common data measures in a standardized natural history study on a disease neutral platform with the ability to customize and layer on robust disease specific measures. We are positioned to provide best practices and training around recruitment, retention, and engagement informed by the depth of our rare disease expertise and community rooted experience to provide meaningful engagement with a representative study population. And we are also well positioned to develop education and resource documents around how to design studies for different purposes. So defining the purpose, limitations, core components, requirements, and level of rigor, identifying what is needed at baseline, and then providing guidance on how to scale, grow, and transition natural history studies and patient registries as needs and communities mature and progress along the continuum toward regulatory activity, guiding the development of standardized, repeatable, well-defined models and processes. And finally, where we are heading under the RDC ADAP is to support the development and demonstrate the effectiveness of rigorously designed natural history studies that can reliably serve as external controls to define, evaluate, and implement global rare disease data standards and tools to ensure that there is a clear return of value to the community as we develop the RDC ADAP, and for NORD to be the first stop for registry development and data integration for the RDC ADAP. So in summary, uh, NORD works alongside and in partnership with rare communities to advance research, drive new scientific findings, and create real impact for individuals living with rare diseases. All of our work is guided by our principles of community engagement, inclusive, inclusivity, transparency, integrity, and reciprocity. Our rare disease research partnerships reflect authentic engagement and sustained collaboration. NORD is the primary initiation point for patient organizations and other stakeholders interested in collecting prospective data and participating in the RDC ADAP. Our model can keep data proprietary and separate, but the community together. And with our partners at CPATH and FDA, we are designing solutions to bridge stakeholder needs and deliver impact. And finally, we hope you will join us as registry partners, data partners, and research project collaborators. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Vanessa. Really informative, great information. Um, we have been asked by a few people if we could turn up the temperature in the room. So just so everyone knows, uh, hopefully it's starting to warm up a little bit, but you should feel it a little bit, um, get, get a little bit warmer as the day moves on. Uh, I would like to bring up our next presenter, Klaus Romero with the Critical Path Institute, to provide an overview of CPATH's approaches to data integration and analytics. Thank you for the introduction, Alexa, and thanks uh, to Nord and CPATH for uh, putting this together and, of course, to the FDA for making this happen. As you um, have heard other uh, speakers uh, give their, their disclaimers, I have a few. I'm, I'm part of a dying breed of uh, clinicians who train in clinical pharmacology. And I also have a degree in epidemiology, so thank you, Dr. Donahue, for the plug about the importance of epidemiology. Um, so you've seen this before, but this is, uh, in, in summary, uh, CPATH is, is about uh, generating solutions, generating solutions for drug development, generating solutions that are actionable and that can actually transform how you develop drugs in the 21st century. But in order to do that, we need to provide the legal infrastructure, 
the scientific infrastructure and the regulatory infrastructure for those stakeholders that you see on the slide, the regulators, the patient advocacy groups, other government agencies, academia, but also, and very importantly, industry, to be able to come together to a neutral space that we provide so that all those stakeholders can share information that they would not be able to share otherwise. And we turn that information into actionable knowledge. And it's that knowledge that helps transform drug development. So in order to get the solutions that we generate adopted by industry, we provide the scientists in industry with a major weapon. And that weapon is called the endorsement of the solutions that we generate in the form of written decisions from the different agencies that then the scientists, you and the companies, can take to upper management. And even with their ADHD, they will pay attention to a letter that is signed by the EMA or the FDA. And so that's important. Okay. But one type of solution that we work on is um, this notion of model-informed drug development. And you might be asking, what is this MIDD thing? Well, uh, the old definition, the first formal definition that was uh, uh, put out there in the literature uh, was in 2007 by a seminal paper co-authored by industry and FDA. And it focused on the definition of the pharmacostatistical models, so this thing called pharmacometrics. But uh, in 2016, there's an updated uh, uh, definition also in another great paper co-authored by FDA and industry. And it broadens it up. We were having a fun conversation over the break about artificial intelligence and some more cutting edge uh, analysis approaches. That definition opens it up for those kinds of methods to also be included as part of the quantitative framework to be able to develop drugs based on actionable knowledge so that you can simulate scenarios in the computer before giving the first dose to the first patient and making sure that you de-risk decision making. So you have heard today uh, many descriptions about the questions that you guys in the industry deal with when you're trying to design a clinical trial. And you heard in the morning session both uh, Jan Woodcock and Teresa Mullen describe how important it is to be able to inform those decisions and there's no way that you can inform those decisions unless you quantify variability. So you heard the notion of, yes, we need to get better at identifying patients. So yes, you may have a specific way of uh, identifying individuals that meet a well-defined set of diagnostic criteria. But even within those individuals that meet those criteria, there's going to be hidden levels of additional variability. And if you miss those, your uncertainty is going to increase and your likelihood of failure is going to increase. So the answer to those questions can only come from three things. The first thing quantifying sources of variability, as you have heard. But what does that mean, really? If you think of variability and uncertainty as a big pie, what you want to do is slice off that pie and make it disappear, hopefully by eating it. And you, t you start taking slices of that pie by identifying which patient features, whatever those are, demographics, genetics, other markers, indicators of, uh, that help you better characterize baseline severity, for example. And you start slicing the pie away in order to make the final slice of remaining uncertainty and variability as small as possible. Is that going to completely disappear? Absolutely not. But the smaller you make it, the more you're going to be certain that your decision making is going to be de-risked. And that's what upper management of companies cares about if you want to make sure that they sponsor and they get behind your rare disease drug development portfolios. So at the, the bottom line, 
is that by understanding the source of variability and thinking of diseases as a continuum with dynamics, that's what gives you the, the, the power to really de-risk decision making. So the second answer is that in order to have the big pie of variability to, so, to start cutting slices from, you need multiple data sources, as many data sources as possible, because you need all the ingredients in the pie. And you start slicing away. But you'd be fooling yourself if you think that just by looking at one data source, one however big observational study is going to give you all the answers, you'd be fooling yourself because you're looking at a smaller pie of variability. And doing the same exercise, you may be falsely thinking that you've shrunken variability to a great degree, when in reality, you have missed all the, vari the other source of variability that are out there in other multiple data sources. And until you integrate all those data sources into a really sound, high quality data platform, you're not going to be able to explain that remaining variability and deal with uncertainty. And so you need to account for heterogeneity. Heterogeneity is good. We are sometimes trained as scientists to think that heterogeneity is bad. No, it's not. As long as you have the means to identify it and quantify it and deal with it, heterogeneity is good. But you need reliable data in order to do that. And the third answer is how do you turn this into something that is actionable? And that's the notion of the concept of the drug trial disease model. And this is a term that was coined by the FDA. And it's essentially a description of a collection of models. You have a backbone at the top that is a quantitative description of the disease dynamics. You quantify disease progression and identify the source of, vari of variability, and that gives you the power to identify the different subpopulations that are going to behave in particular ways throughout uh, your clinical trials. But then you cannot stop there. You need to understand the drug effects, and you need to model the drug effects. But you also need to model out the very important aspects of clinical trial design. And if the disease in question has a neurological component, understanding the placebo effect, onset, duration, magnitude, and variability is absolutely key. And also understanding the dropouts. What is the time varying probability of a patient dropping out from follow-up depending on how you design the study? Because it's not just important to compare apples to apples, it's also ideal to compare the same number of apples with the same number of apples in the beginning and at the end of the study. What are the sources of data that you need to develop such a tool? Well, for disease progression, you need all the longitudinal information that you've heard about today and that we plan to integrate as, plan of, as part of the RDCA DAP initiative. But in order to build the drug effect models and the trial components of the models, you're going to need clinical trial data and real world evidence. That's also going to be very important. So if you put it all together, and this is something that uh, one of the brilliant mathematicians that I have the privilege of uh, supervising, Jackson Burton, and I learned from Roby at CHDI. He was the one who taught us to speak like this. You start with the checkmate. What do you want to get? You want to get that clinical trial simulator at the end, that drug disease trial model that you can turn into a clinical trial simulator so that you guys in the industry can de-risk decision making. That's what you want to get. Now, how do you get there? Well, you need to build the models. But in order to build the models, you need to have the reliable and high quality data that can support the development of those mathematical structures. But there's no way you can get the data unless you actually go and pursue the data. And you need to manage the heck out of the data. And that's something that uh, we do day in and day out. And Rick and Amanda in the room, are, that's what they do every day at CPATH. But in terms of execution, 
Of course we move in that direction. We start with the data, we manage the data, we put the databases together, and then we start having fun with the mathematics to build the solutions. So, in terms of clinical trial uh, patient level data that we have aggregated and integrated at CPATH, you see all the diseases that we work on and the numbers of uh, data, uh, patient level data that we have. This number has grown to over 80,000, but the exact number will come when we finally curate those additional data sets. We have uh, more than 1,600 new patients uh, from, the, from uh, kidney transplantation, and we have another good uh, additional uh, two to 3,000 Alzheimer's uh, patient level data sets, uh, but they have not been curated yet. So it's not there yet, but it will, now it's over 80,000 uh, patient level data points that we have. And we also have a, a pretty amazing uh, gene uh, sequencing database for tuberculosis. So this is the pathogen, not, not the humans, it's the pathogen, but it still gave us a nice opportunity to deal with uh, genomics data and start handling that kind of information. And that's gonna provide the foundation, of course. There's additional complicating factors with uh, human genetic data, but those are all solvable. You've seen this. You start with the data, you put the data through the, sorry, Samantha, the value chain of data. Um, that's what Brink and uh, Amanda do every day. And you get to a point where you have the data ready for analysis. For me and my team to interact with the key researchers out there that have the expertise in the clinical aspects of the diseases, that have the expertise in the molecular pathways and pathophysiology of the different conditions, to then come up with the actionable solutions. And what are those solutions? Well, again, it's those models that you can then package as clinical trial simulators. That's what we want to get to, and that's what, where we will arrive by going through that journey of data integration and transformation into knowledge, which is exactly what we're talking about. At the end of the day, we want to provide the, the framework for the community to run clinical trial simulations and clinical study simulations because you can also inform the design of observational studies through this kind of effort. So you start with the, with the drug trial disease model framework, then you're able to run simulations, you're able to compare different operating char characteristics of different design options. That's what gives you the substrate to make more informed decisions about trial design. Then you run the studies and then you feed the data back into the platform so that this becomes a learn and confirm wheel. If you dissect this, again, as I've been saying, to its most fundamental components, it's three things. There's an input, then there's modeling, and then there's an output. The input is the patient level data. The modeling is about identifying and quantifying the sources of variability and turning that into an understanding of disease dynamics, and this is an example of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and Jane knows that this is one of my favorite uh, projects that we're working on right now, with some really cool academic collaborators. And that's what, the output is what, what gives you that understanding of how the disease changes over time, and what are the different subpopulations, and how can you identify those, uh, those subpopulations and then deal with the drug effects and all the other clinical trial design aspects to then have the clinical trial simulators ready to review by the regulatory agencies and ready to use by industry. So if you dissect that even further down, it's three things. It's data and transforming those data into knowledge. But that knowledge that we're talking about is very, needs to be very actionable and it's all about optimizing trial and study design. That's really what we're talking about here. So that you can de-risk decision making and you can uh, make much more informed decisions and sell your uh, rare disease portfolios in a much more powerful way to upper management. Let me give you a couple of examples of impact. So type one diabetes, yes, not a rare disease, but it's type one diabetes prevention. You probably saw the news of a breakthrough designation of a new therapy. Coincidence? Maybe not. So you have here the endpoint. What is the endpoint? 
reaching a clinical diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. Binary. It's pretty straightforward. You either reach the diagnosis or you don't. What are the main factors that help you understand what's the time varying probability of you reaching that diagnosis? It's how many autoantibodies you're positive for at different time points. And you can see that even if you look at the baseline features, just how many autoantibodies you have at baseline, just looking at that, at that gives you a pretty cool look as to what's the likelihood of conversion to a diagnosis. You can use that right there to optimize your clinical trial design. But the models don't think for you. Because those individuals that are positive for three autoantibodies at baseline might be the hardest to treat population. So is that really the, the population you want to focus on for your trials? Maybe not. But those that are positive for two, that could be the winning subpopulation for those studies. But let's turbocharge this right now. And let's not think about binary endpoints and binary factors at baseline. Let's look at continuous endpoints and continuous sources of variability. Duchenne, again. This is a really complex model we're developing because we're looking at six different measures of disease dynamics. Does anybody see the six minute walk test up there as part of that list of endpoints? No. Why? Because we had a really good conversation with the agencies and with industry, and it was identified that that was probably not the best measure, the most informative measure to track disease dynamics. So then we had a conversation, okay, so what common denominator measures are in the data? And which one of those could be really informative? This is the list that we landed on. The North Star, three velocities, force vital capacity, and the Bruce scale. What's important about this is that each one of those measures tells a story at different stages of the disease, but it's not like it's buckets. It's a continuum. And by developing this model, industry will have, and of course the FDA will have that tool as well, a framework to then have much more informed conversations about the selection of endpoints and clinical trial design with the agency. Are we asking the agency to stamp these endpoints? No. Are we using the S word, surrogates? Mm -mm. Not even by a long shot. But what we're doing is providing the quantitative framework for industry to be able to have these kinds of conversations about trial design with the agency in a situation which every party speaks the same background quantitative language. And that's what's so powerful about this effort. And so this is fresh from the presses, the Friedrich Ataxia database, which uh, will be one of the first to be part of uh, the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator uh, data and analytics platform. This is just a very preliminary look at the 20 feet walk velocity test. What do you see there? It looks familiar. A gain of function stage and then a loss of function stage. By the way, Clinical pharmacology, absorption, elimination, that's, that's, you can model that. So you see a similar, very similar dynamic here. Is this gonna have sources of variability? Absolutely. Is this the most informative measure? We haven't even had that conversation yet, but we will. And we may end up dropping this measure or including this measure into a comprehensive look of disease dynamics for Friedrich's ataxia. So, models, trials, and endpoints. It's all about quantifying so sources of variability so that you can understand which measures. Measures, is that clinical uh, scales? Is that some other kind of uh, patient reported outcome measure? It could, or some uh, biological marker, imaging marker? Absolutely, let's take a look at all those sources of variability together and understand how they interact together so that we can decrease uncertainty through quantitation. Oop, oh, that was too much. Okay, so this is an example. This is a, well, I'm using a regulatory endorsed tool, the Alzheimer's Clinical Trial Simulator that uh, Samantha described. The example I'm gonna run is gonna be unrealistic for the Alzheimer's world, but I hope it illustrates a point that I want, hopefully, to have you guys resonate with for rare diseases. Let's imagine for a second that Alzheimer's disease 
is a condition in which you can only realistically hope to enroll 50 patients in a study. Okay, let's assume that you have a really good drug that is able to have the rate of progression by half. Even if you run the simulation just with those two sources of variability together, you're still not winning at the end. So what do you do? You can say, okay, so what if I use APOE4, a genetic marker, to enrich my study? And I include only people that are going to be positive for at least one allele of APOE4. Even in that scenario, you're still not winning. But what happens if you, on top of everything else, you account for a better characterization of baseline severity? And you really hone in on the population that, that is not as crazy variable at baseline. You have a winner of a design. Does this guarantee that the drug is going to be successful? Of course not. You still need to run the trial. But what you are ensuring is that if the drug is flawed, the trial is going to fla fail because of the drug, not, be not because of the design. So, again, models, trials, and biomarkers, well, again, it's all about source of variability. So don't get too hung up on the B word, biomarkers. Because if you're not counting safety or diagnostic biomarkers, biomarkers are really one of two things. They're either a covariant in a model or part of the measures that describe disease dynamics in a model, together with everything else. And it's about the quantitation of those sources of variability and those measures and how they behave over time. So there you have it. That's what we're going to be doing. But we want to provide the users of the data with a way to also interact with the data in a user-friendly manner. So, at the end of the day, this is the most important equation that I've learned after being 12 years at CPATH. Success is a function of time and people. So thank you people for putting in the time to be here and thank you for hopefully committing to be part of this initiative and take the journey with us. And with that, I'll conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. I believe we're going to do time for questions. So, so if anybody has a burning question or not. Yes, there's a question over there. Do we have the mic? I have to be a statistician from the FDA, so I have a few questions. Please. Um, I, for, the, for the first one of the talks that I saw, you were combining data from multiple sources. So those are hard because yes. sometimes the metadata is not complete. That's the way we document how stuff was collected, the inclusion exclusion. How would you provide traceability so we know which protocols were logically combined? So that's one question I have. I also believe all models are wrong. So there's this question of um, how you check the sensitivity of the kind of components that you put in your model. And, and then finally, um, there's measurement error in a lot of these things. And, and doing them right, like cognitive impairment, is a tough one. And there are lots of different instruments out there. And it may depend on a person's good day and bad day, how well they're measured. And I was wondering how you deal with all of those kinds of things in your modeling. Awesome question. So let's start at the beginning, the metadata. Absolutely. The, the integration of patient level data cannot happen without the metadata. And unless we are able to ascertain that the metadata is good quality as well, then we're going to start having issues with the data integration. So that's going to be part of the, of the diagnosis of the relevance of the different data sources to be part of this. And we need to account for that. And when we present these models to the FDA, guess what the appendix number one is? 
all the protocols of all the studies that were included in the data sets that were part of the building of the solution. Um, that's number one. Number two, uh, the um, validation of the models. Yes, all models are wrong. I agree with that, but some are useful. That's correct. So, and we want to focus on the useful ones. So um, the, the external validation exercise is, is really rigorous uh, when we put these tools through a formal review, review process at the FDA. And Kevin can speak for that in the back. Uh, he's been dealing with those quite a bit. And uh, yeah, you guys, you guys uh, really know what you're doing and asking the right questions because one of the things that we would never be able to do is just fly a model without a formal external validation exercise. So we need to have enough data sets so that we can reserve at least one that is good quality and represents the, 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 the uh, target context of use that we want to have that model be used for. Uh, to then run a formal external validation exercise. But of course, that doesn't stop there, and that's why we have that wheel of learn and confirm, because there's, 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 there has to be a life cycle to those models. And some of those learnings might be like, for example, one major source of variability that everybody thinks is important may be related to another, may, may be a representation of another underlying source of variability that will only become apparent once additional data sets are collected. And so a given covariate might get completely dropped from a model and replaced by a series of other covariates or another covariate that is more uh, related to the actual mechanistic biological uh, processes of the condition. And the third question was about, remind me, the, um, oh, uh, the, the patient, the heterogeneity in measurement. Yes, uh, absolutely valid point. We have to account for that. And um, that's why we need to make sure that we are able to build random effects into the models that account for intersubject variability and hopefully also interstudy variability. Is that the perfect solution? Well, no, no. But at least you're accounting for it and you're putting numbers behind that so that you can generate then the virtual po populations from which to simulate. And of course, again, it's all about is the underlying uncertainty going to completely disappear? Absolutely not. And that's part of the conversation for the Duchenne example, in which we sat down with the agency and we went, six minute walk, te walk test, maybe not the best. Are these other perfect measures? Absolutely not. But compared to nothing, just the standard approach of the crystal ball, the wing and a prayer, and kind of gauging the winds with your finger, maybe not as uh, great. So did I cover all the yeah, I, did. I, I only had one more question because when companies come in to the agency, one of the things they worry about is incomplete data. Patients drop out. Oh yeah, some of these missing this. Oh. And they drop out for a variety of reasons that sometimes are hard to document. You know, it, it's, it's kind of like, we call it missing not at random. <laughs> like yes. Like throwing up for the last, and you don't have that as a point in your model, so you have to worry about it. So how are you dealing with dropouts because that, that will impede trial success. So that, that was the other thing that that's, I wanted to point That's out. another thing that I always ask for uh, at OCP and your colleagues from BIAS, that's when they review things. Ha have, you, are you, have you thought about your missingness and what kind of dropout model are you gonna develop? And in the Duchenne example, it's not at random. So we're, we're dealing with that and we're working through those issues. So yes, absolutely on point. Okay, I'm done. Anybody else have any questions? <laughs> That, that was fun. That's the kind of conversation I like. Well, uh, it's me. Sorry, Thomas. Uh, first, really congratulations to a great presentation class. It was absolutely refreshing. I shouldn't use a mic to begin with. <laughs> yeah. I, I absolutely applaud your statement. Heterogeneity is good. And I understand from your presentation what we want to do is not get rid of heterogeneity, but rather reduce the slices of unexplained variability and replace it by explained variability and take that into account when we study drug effects in patients. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct, yeah. yes. Absolutely on the same page, thank you. And there was a question over here, I think. Oh, yeah. Can, uh, up front.
Um, as far as like other data registries that are already in place, so like me and my dad have Huntington's disease, there's the HD enroll trial. Aside from obviously being much benefit to patients, how is CPATH and FDA Nord going to convince the other registries that your guys' is better? Great question. So we actually have a dedicated consortium in Huntington's disease, Emily's right there. And uh, we, we are, uh, the enrolled data set is one of the key ones. And we've actually started to integrate those data into the database for that specific consortium. So there's a, there's a dedicated consortium at CPATH dealing with Huntington's disease. So come see us later and we can connect you with that, with that group. Okay. Yeah, and so are all these databases that you guys are getting data imported from, are they going to have to conform to um, what you guys called strobe? Like, are they gonna have to conform to that data set of um, prescribed like procedures for clinical trials? Well, yeah, that's a great question. So uh, the, the intention is to make sure that the data coming in are, are properly handled and then properly standardized so that we, you can make heads of and tails out of the data, right? Because you don't want to have, like in the Alzheimer's example, when we started this, nine trials, nine different ways of recording sex. How can you be that creative? I don't understand that, but that was the reality. Now multiply that by orders of magnitude complexity when you start dealing with outcome measures like the ADAS cog or the CDR small boxes for cognition and the um, measurements like the unified uh, hunting disease rating scale and, and things of that nature. So the, so the standardization is gonna have to happen. Now, in terms of how to feed that back to making sure that the data that are generated after we run the exercise start collecting and recording the data in standardized ways so that we minimize the need for remapping, that's also part of the, part of the mix in the conversation. Does that answer the question? So, so is strobe going to be like this new set of universal standards that you guys are trying to push to make it so? It's, it's actually C-DISC. C-DISC? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's the, the Clinical Trial Data Interchange Standards Consortium. Okay. And that's what FDA mandates that, that you actually submit your data in. And okay. for good reason. And follow up conversation. All right, awesome, thank you. We can nerd out, nerd out about data. Yes. Uh, thank you, Klaus, for a very informative um, presentation. Uh, Ron Bartek, the Friedrich Taxi Research Alliance, and thank you, too, for using our disease as one of your exemplars. Um, quick question based on the fact that I, um, I admit that when I've looked at the CPATH Institute's wonderful work in this regard, I focus mostly on the data integration rather than the analytic, analytics platform. So I want to ask you if you could expand upon um, how you're doing the analytics, um, what, what level of resources and time devoting to that, and are you integrating the disease scientific community in those analytics um, exercises? Yeah, so yeah, great question. So um, the quantitative medicine program at CPATH has just doubled its size. Um, and so now we have a team of a uh, grand total of seven people. And we're super excited about that because we're bringing in some really orthogonal capacities. Uh, pharmacometrics, uh, statistics, systems pharmacology, artificial intelligence, um, uh, biomedical engineering to look at the digital measures as well, and, and so those kinds of things. Um, how long does it take? The longest step is actually getting the data and then getting the data in shape for analysis. Um, once everything's said and done, it's a matter of, of um, half a year to a year to solve all the modeling problems in a, in a disease. But in between, that's not like it's something like where you get the data and then go and six months later you have an answer. It's an iterative process because you start exploring the data and of course, and there's an example in the Duchenne uh, database of this woman with Duchenne that was allegedly 113 years old and was rocking the six minute walk test. So, the, so those, that kind of wheel needs to, and, and so that, that takes time, but if you compress just a pure analytics time, six months to a year. Uh, and uh, disease and clinical and, and uh, mechanistic expertise, absolutely, that, that's needed, absolutely needed. And so in the, in the work groups that, that we run, and Emily can uh, attest for this, we have really fun 
uh, modeling and simulation calls every month where we all come together and we start discussing things from all the different orthogonal angles because it's not, this is not modeling for modeling's sake. And remember, I'm a clinician. I, I'm the first one to advocate that this needs to be clinically relevant. Otherwise, we're, we're just having fun with numbers, which is fun, but we're really not doing much. Does that answer the question? I think that's, yes, one more. Hi, I'm Alex Cruz with the Platelet Disorder Support Association. Uh, we are one of the registries uh, with NORD. We run the ITP registry. Um, one thing that we really like and why we initially partnered with NORD is the autonomy that we have to use our data to be able to address issues that most matter to ITP patients. So my question is if PDSA were to integrate all of the data from our ITP registry into the new platform, would we still be able to have access to that data to do what we like with? Otherwise, it wouldn't work. Great. Yes. The answer is yes, absolutely. Otherwise, it's a pointless exercise. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much. This was a lot of fun. Thanks so much, Klaus. It's exciting to see how this type of integration and collaboration can really address some of the challenges that we heard about all morning with regard to drug development. So we'll, time, we'll take a quick break now. If everyone can come back at 2.45, uh, we'll then wrap up with our closing panel and final comments from FDA. 2.45.